Awesome. Aren't we blessed to have a nice, cool place to come and sit? Is that awesome? I love air conditioning. Anyways, I've been prepping for this message for a long time, and a couple of months ago I prayed, and I said, God, we need breakthrough in our lives. I need breakthrough in my life, and I know that you guys need breakthrough in your lives, and it's amazing we sung that song tonight because that was my prayer. I said, God, how can I explain you to where it will come into our hearts, into our minds, and into our lives where there be breakthrough. I just heard God's soft, quiet voice say, you can't explain me. I'm unexplainable. And I said, what does that mean? And I began to pray about that. What does that mean? And I've been reading the Old Testament, and I just got to, um, I'm right about Leviticus, and uh, Every once in a while, I'll read the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. It's my favorite. But God says, every once in a while, I'll go back and read a gospel. And so I opened up God's Word, and it flipped right open to the book of Mark. And I started reading the introduction. And it's interesting that Mark is written to the audience of Gentile believers, right? I was like, well, I'm a Gentile believer. Perfect. And it was also written to Roman believers, people that, um, you know, all of the Romans that had come to Christ as well. So well, this is going to be interesting. And I said, why do you have me here, God? And God says, because I can't, you can't explain me to people. They have to go on a journey. And it has to be your journey. Every one of you guys are on your own special journey, learning and discovering who the real Jesus is. Is that cool? Well, as I began to dig into the book of Mark, I realized that it's a story about the 12 disciples and their journey to discover the real Jesus. And the book of Mark explains who that is. But they didn't find out until the book of Acts. Is that cool? We're going to look at that tonight. I remember... Um, a couple of years ago, I had a dear friend that I went to high school with. We ran the streets together. He got, we got clean together, and I, I, he went back out, and um, he didn't make it. He took his life, and um, I don't know if you guys remember Troy Smith. I, I know my buddy Matt knows Troy and Tommy, and uh, anyways, I'm not sure what happened, but I remember seeing um, all of the posts online about what happened, and they were having a... I don't know if it was a wake or kind of a meeting. Anyways, I didn't make it. I was really busy, and I think I was going to church that night. And uh, all of these people were chiming in, oh, I'm praying. I'll be praying. And everyone is asking for prayer. And I got to thinking, I was like, who are they praying to? Because most of the people that are praying are people that are way far away from God. They obviously, they don't know Jesus. I've never heard them speak even the name of Jesus or even talk about him or even, I don't even know if they're thinking about Jesus. What are, what are they praying to, right? When I was in Bible school, I, um, I took this one really cool class and I read this book. It was on uh, this topic. It was called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. And it was kind of about the, the world. And it was about what I'm talking about. These people that... They're, they, they're actually deists, and what a deist is is that somebody who believes there's a God out there and believes in God, but they don't have any relationship with God. They think that God's this nebulous figure that's kind of way out in outer space, and when you have a, a problem or a tragedy or somebody's a victim in your family or you need to come out of a foxhole, you pray to him, and then as soon as all of the, the tragedy and all of the uh, the trouble in your life is gone, right? You get a little breakthrough. Uh, God doesn't exist anymore. And you're living your normal life again. And it's this, people run to this God for therapy. And um, they run to, and they talk about God sometimes because he's moral. He's a good moral character. But there's no relationship in their life. I think uh, when you look out in the world today, we can all agree that the Christian faith is under constant ridicule, right? It's under scrutiny, and people are always poking fingers at Christians. 
my little boy's been getting bullied in school a lot. And one of the things that brings it about is when he mentions the name of Jesus. Because he went from a private Christian school two years ago, and now he's in public school because we can't, we don't have a way to get him into the private school anymore. They bully him because of the name of Jesus. I remember um, I love AA and NA, and uh, I remember when I first became a Christian, I would go down to those meetings, and not because I liked the message that they were sharing, because a lot of it was pretty volatile, but I would pray for the guys that were would take the meetings hostage. And um, a lot of them wound up coming to uh, celebrate recovery. Uh, Tim and Vicki, Reardon. Was that their last name? Is it Reardon or Reardon? I think it was Reardon. Yep. And uh, a couple other ones that I'm not going to mention. But um, I would go down there and listen and pray. And a lot of people talked about God down there. But as soon as you start talking a lot about Jesus, some pe people would just get up and they'd leave. They don't want to hear about Jesus. I remember this one guy, his higher power was his bike tire. Right? And so... He had to talk to his bike tire and tell his bike not to allow him to pedal to the dope house. I would talk, and I wouldn't talk about Jesus, but after I was done speaking, and I would tell everybody, I'm not afraid to admit that my higher power is Jesus. Because if you start talking about Jesus, some people get up and get right in your face. And that's not just those meetings, it's out in the world. Christianity is under attack these days. We are a minority here. And a lot, of it keep, a lot of it, it keeps us in fear of being out in the world and talking about Jesus. It's being attacked on every platform around the world. It's not the freedom of religion anymore. It's freedom from Jesus. People are trying to get freedom from Jesus. Why is that? It's funny, the people that ask you to pray for them when tragedy strikes are the same people that are getting in your face telling you that they don't want to hear about Jesus. What Jesus are they praying to? What Jesus are you praying to? Is it the real one? Here's a slide, here's a bold statement. If the Jesus you met hasn't dramatically changed your life, then maybe you met the wrong Jesus. Amen? When Jesus died on the cross and he, he resurrected for 40 days, he would appear at random time to the disciples and the believers to show that he is actually real, to show that he was still alive, but to help them to realize what actually happened at the cross. A lot of them went back to their, you know, their, their lifestyles and, and, and some of the things that they did. I mean, here's this Jesus, and he was awesome. And, but I don't think they really understand really who the real Jesus actually was. And you can read that through the book of Mark's. So we're going to start in the book of Acts, though, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 8. I love this. This is one of my favorite books. It's a theological link between the Old and New Testament. It links them together, and it actually brings Jesus to light. So the, the, Jesus had been showing himself to these disciples for a long time, uh, for about 40 days. And one time he showed himself to the disciples, and they were meeting together, and they asked him, Lord, at this time, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Kind of an interesting question. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here's these guys that have been hanging out with Jesus for a few years, watching him perform miracles, watching him get in the face of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the religious, the Herodians and all these religious leaders, the teachers of the law, and um, refuting them, disputing with them, 
and watching them put him on the cross, but they still hadn't fully grasped who Jesus was. They said, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, let me tell you what was going on during that time. The Romans had come to Jerusalem, and they brought these giant Roman armies with them. And they, it wasn't a, a really nasty takeover. It was sort of kind of like a Cold War takeover. They marched in with all these armies. And they said, this is our land now. You don't like it? Here's my army. What are you going to do about it? So the people, they had to back away and do what the Romans asked them to. The disciples were still, even after walking and talking and living with Jesus, they still believed that the Messiah was going to come blazing in, like blazing guns in glory, and wipe out the Romans and uh, get rid of this Roman occupation. They had the wrong Jesus. Jesus didn't come for that, did he? He came to wipe out the stuff that was going on in their hearts. He came for breakthrough. But they were looking in the wrong spot. The Romans were really nasty. They would come and um, they would uh, extort the people for taxes, really lots of taxes. And sometimes the tax collectors, that's why they're so hated, they were traitors to the citizens because they were actually Jews that would collect taxes for the Romans, and they were considered traitors. And so if you couldn't pay your taxes, the first thing that you would do is you would sell um, either your land or your children into slavery. And that would pay part of your taxes. And then when the next tax season would come, that you would sell your land, everything you owned, all your possessions. And then when the next tax season would come, you would, they would sell, um, they couldn't pay, they would go to debtor's prison. And so the Romans literally, they took everything from the people. That was the oppression that they were under. And that's why the disciples, they were looking for that Messiah to come and wipe all of that out. But that's not what he came for, is it? I love this passage because it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You know what power is? Power is a Greek word, and it's called dunamis. Do you, anybody know what that actually means? Dynamic. What else? Yeah. Dynamo. Dynamo. Anybody heard of dynamite? That's where we get the word dynamite from the Greek word dunamis. That's the power that Jesus brought for all of us when the Holy Spirit came on them at Pentecost. Dynamite. Is that awesome? That's the power that Jesus gives us to live inside of us. Amazing. Sometimes we have to know and believe that we have this power living inside of us that's huge. That's where our breakthroughs come from. But we have to... to Dig into that somehow. I love that. What was the power for, though? Why did Jesus give us the power? Well, he gave us, he told us right here, you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. At that time, Rome was the only known the furthest that actually they knew you could travel, and they would call the Rome the ends of the earth. They were going to bring the gospel, the breakthrough message to the Romans, the people that were oppressing them. Wow. Jesus gives us his power to go and be his witnesses in the world. Is that awesome? Man, that's amazing. Well, let's rewind the book a little bit. Isn't it funny that as you read uh, through the Gospels and Jesus does a miracle, he's, he would often tell the people, don't go tell anybody about it, right? That's weird. Why is that? Well, I think it's because Jesus didn't want 
the people to see him as the great miracle worker. They didn't want to see Jesus as what they could get out of him or from him, what he, what he could do for you. That's not why Jesus came. Those guys also had the wrong Jesus. Remember this one story? Jesus had just gotten in feeding 5,000, over 5,000 people. It says 5,000 men, right? Well, if you were a guy and you had a wife and they didn't have any birth control back then, so they had tons of children, usually like seven or eight. Let's just call it like three. That was probably like 20 or 25,000 people there. And they had a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus took that, broke it. He used that power that he had, that dynamite, and he broke it and he passed it out amongst all these people. Unfortunately, I don't think Jesus wanted to do that, but he did because he loved the people and he, and he wanted to meet a need in their lives, but he didn't want them to see them as this miracle worker. And, include, and especially the, the disciples, they were there witnessing this, right, firsthand. Can you imagine that? Jesus tells his disciples to get into this boat and head out uh, across the, the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. It's the same place. What's interesting is the Lake of or the Sea of Galilee. It was below sea level, and uh, actually, um, it was below Mount Hermon, and it eventually flowed into the Dead Sea, which was below sea level. And these winds, sometimes you'd get a cold front that would come over and it get stuck on the mountain. And you know what cold air does? When it comes over the water, um, the water's warm, and the, the warm air would push the cold air up and make a violent storm. Well, the cold air would hit the mountain, and it was just kind of like a funnel or a ski slope. And it would hit the mountain, and it would curl around, and it would <laughs> across the lake. And you'd get these violent storms with four or five, six-foot waves. They didn't have sailboats that could withstand the, the, the um, violent waves. The boats were about as long as this row of benches here, and the disciples were out here in this, in this uh, lake, and the, the storm blew up. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was nasty. And so we're going to look at this. It's in Mark chapter 6, and it's verse 50. It's the second half of verse 50. And it's 51 and 52. Here's this big storm, and uh, they're, they're, th they're thinking, we're dead now. Like, Jesus put us in this boat, and he's probably want us to croak. And here comes Jesus walking on the water, and they think he's a ghost. And it says in verse 50, it says, Because they all saw him, they were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them, and he said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, rightfully so. For they had not understood about the loaves, right? The feeding of the 5,000. They were still like kind of, whoa, blown away. And then I read this. Their hearts were hardened. That's weird. I was like, why is that? Why would the Mark write that in his gospel? Their hearts were hardened. And I think what is going on here is they still haven't figured out who the real Jesus is. They still think he's this miracle worker. This, um, he just does all these amazing stuff, and he says some weird stuff to them. They still didn't understand that. And they were hard-hearted to Jesus' words. Just like we all can be at times, right? Jesus is always... I wish Jesus would be like, Josh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you. Sit down, son. We're going to have a conversation. But he doesn't. And sometimes I'll read God's word, and I'll say, okay, that's not for me, that's not for me, that's not for me. Wow, that's something, that's something historical. I'm going to read that. Because I like the, all the little nuggets in there. And sometimes I miss the good stuff, and I think we do too. We can be informed about the, what the Word says sometimes, but refuse to believe that Jesus will come and help us out when we are in times of trouble. 
This type of act, reaction, it's not an unbelief, but it's literally a hard-hearted rejection of Christ's ability to help us. We're denoy, denying the dynamite, right? And we're shoving it under the rug. But Jesus, just like he told the disciples in the boat, he says, take courage. Amen? So sometimes when that storm of life comes by and you don't quite understand what God's Word says, this one's really easy to understand. Take courage. Jesus will help us. Amen? Sometimes we spend too much energy seeking possessions, pleasure, position, popularity, all the other Ps. I love to go camping, and I'm a rock hound, and I love to be outdoors, and sometimes that gets in the way, my way of my relationship with Jesus, and it gets in the way of my fellowship with you guys. Jesus reminds us in Mark chapter 8. I love this. This came right after Jesus rebukes Peter. Jesus said that I'm going to go die on the cross, right? And Peter jumps up and says, no, you're never going to do that. And Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. Well, Jesus still had, or Peter still had the wrong Jesus, right? He wanted Jesus' words seemed harsh, unsympathetic. But Jesus is like, that's not why I came here. Peter wasn't considering God's purposes, but in his own mind, his own natural human desires and feelings is what he was focused on, right? He wanted Christ to be the king, to come and wipe out the Romans, but, he did, but not the suffering servant. He was ready to watch Jesus receive the glory of being the Messiah, and Jesus wanted, or Peter wanted the, the glory of following the Messiah, but he didn't want the persecution that came along with it. And Jesus said, you get behind me. That's not why I came here. And I think that's why when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, and Peter said, no, you're not going to do that. Not my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you're going to have no part in me. Jesus was still showing him that you have to humble yourselves. And that's when Peter was starting to realize, okay, there's something more to Jesus than the king. And Peter said, well, don't just wash my feet. Do, do all of me. So right after Jesus had rebuked Peter in Mark 8.35, he says this. Anyone who, he talks about taking up his cross, you have to deny yourself. Then he says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man ex give it in exchange for his soul? He was telling Peter the truth. And that truth was drilling down. Amen? Sometimes we don't want to hear the truth, do we? We have a very short time here on earth. We don't have enough time for addictions. We don't have enough time for dysfunction. We don't have enough time to go hang out at the bar. We have plenty of time to raise our families and teach them about Jesus so that our kids can teach their kids about Jesus and we can teach our grandkids about Jesus. Great question to ask yourself. Am I willing to make the pursuit of God more important than the selfish pursuit of pleasure. The disciples were still caught up in the pursuit of position and power after they had been spending time with Jesus, personally spending time with Jesus. They still weren't getting it. Amen? You feel like sometimes you're not getting it. <laughs> you're not alone. We don't have Jesus face to face. 
These poor disciples, they spent time with Jesus all the time. They still weren't getting it. Give yourself a little bit of credit. It's a journey, right? Take a breath. It's one day at a time. Let's look at Mark chapter 10. It's verses 13 and 14. This is interesting to me. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me. For the kingdom of God, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God, God belongs to such as these. The disciples... Jesus, throughout the Gospels, was criticized for spending too much time with people like tax collectors, sinners, children. I think if we were there running the streets, smoking fentanyl, Jesus would be hanging out with us. Amen. These, this is who Jesus hung out with. He would be downtown on 2nd Street and Division with those guys. And he got criticized for that. Even the disciples, he was spending time with children. Children weren't looked at like today. Children are special in our society. Back then, children were kind of, you were to be seen, not heard. You weren't important like the kids are now. And the disciples knew that. And they thought that Jesus should be spending more time with important leaders and people of power, people who are considered devout in order to improve his position and avoid all the criticism. And that they often would tell Jesus that. But Jesus didn't need to improve his position because he was God. His position was already big. Amen. There were four main religious groups that loved their positions in the Bible. You had the Pharisees. They were like the synagogue leaders, rulers. They took care of all of that stuff. There was the Sadducees. They were the, the great high priest was come, came out of the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the, regu- in the resurrection, so they were very sad, you see. Then there was the Herodians. They were followers of Herod the Great, and they supported the dynasty of Herod the Great. He built a huge temple for the people after it was destroyed in the Old Testament. He rebuilt a really awesome one to try to politically boost him in front of everybody else. But his son became ruler of Judea, and something happened. Uh, His son was to uh, keep the dynasty going, right? Well, something happened, and he came out of favor with the people, and um, the Romans pushed him out of power, and they brought in uh, somebody who was um, uh, who would control the people and who would directly report to the Romans. And I don't think uh, Herod was doing right with the Romans, so they replaced him. They hated Jesus, the Herodians did because they feared that Jesus was going to cause this political unrest, this, like, political hate rid for the Jews. And so all of these four groups are the who the disciples thought that Jesus needs to be hanging out with. And that's not what Jesus came. He came to hang out with us. Is that awesome? I love that. Knowing that Jesus is God is the key that unlocks our faith. We have to have the right Jesus. Amen? Sometimes it's hard to believe that Jesus is God. Our faith is unexplainable to most people, but when we can finally grasp that Jesus is God himself, and God himself has this power, this dynamite that he gives us personally, our faith becomes explainable to ourselves. We understand it. We get this understanding in our being. Amen? I love this. This is the best way to explain it in Daniel chapter 7. I love the book of Daniel. This is the passage that 
they hung on when they thought about the Messiah. It says, it's chapter 7, it's verse 13. Daniel was talking about a vision that he had. He says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and he was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All people and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. When Jesus would stand in front of the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law and refute them, he would call himself the Son of Man, and they would become furious because they knew from the Scriptures that he was talking about this passage, and he was referring him to himself as God alone. That's why they would get mad. It led him to the cross, calling himself the Son of Man. It's not enough to know what others say about Jesus. You must know, understand, and accept for yourself that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of Man. You want to know why the Christian faith is constantly under ridicule? It's because there's only one faith that threatens the darkness of addiction. There's only one God that promises the demise of Satan, and there's only one name that the demons hear and flee from. Christianity offers the only hope of this world because it professes the Son of God who came to be the Savior of the world, and His name is Jesus. He's the King of kings. He's our Lord of lords. He's the creator and sustainer and the author and finisher of our faith. You can mock Him. You can drag His name through the mud, and you can dismiss His followers. But one day, I guarantee you, Every knee is going to bow before God and Jesus, and he's going to confess that he is the Son of God, and he's going to judge the earth where everyone will give an account of their lives before him and on his holy throne. Do you guys believe that? If you do, this is the dynamite that the Spirit has given to us. This is how we explain our faith to people. and You have to believe that. This is the knowledge of the truth. And I hope and pray that you guys will leave here knowing the real Jesus. If you don't, then all of this is unexplainable. But if you do, he will radically change your life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that this message will sink into our hearts and that our journey will lead us to the real, true Jesus. Not the one who comes and wipes out oppression and all of the bad stuff around us, but one that gives us breakthrough in our own lives, one that exposes our sin, one that exposes our need for a Savior, and one that helps us to see that we can't do life on our own and that we need you every day, every minute, every second, and every step of the way in our lives. Help us to realize that. And I pray for every person in this room that you radically change our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.